the God helmet, uh, when it was originally created, was uh, it's this yellow motorcycle helmet filled with electromagnetic coils uh, aimed to stimulate very specific areas of the temporal lobes of the brain, which have been really associated with mystical experience. So I'm going to read a, a passage from a Wired Magazine article it's called This Is Your Brain on God, which described the author's experiences with the God helmet. So here's a quote from author Jack Hitt. Quote, I drift almost at once into a warm bath of oblivion. Something is definitely happening. During the 35-minute experiment, I feel a distinct sense of being withdrawn from the envelope of my body and set adrift in an infinite existential emptiness, a deep sensation of waking slumber. The machines outside the chamber report an uninterrupted alertness on my part. Occasionally, I surface to an alpha state where I sort of know where I am, but not quite. This feeling is cool, like being reinsert, reinserted into my body. Then there's a separation again of body and soul, and almost by my will, I happily allow myself to drift back to the surprisingly bearable lightness of oblivion. End quote. So Todd Murphy, he's one of uh, Dr. Persinger, who again is uh, the co found the co-creator of the God Helmet. Uh, Todd Murphy was one of his mentees for over 12 years, and he's one of the most experienced and knowledgeable individuals on the planet on this technology. And in this episode, I pick his brain on all aspects of this God Helmet, you know, how it was discovered, how Dr. Persinger discovered this technology, how it works, uh, what's going on in the brain when uh, they're under this helmet, and how are things like out-of-body experiences and mystical experiences how, is, how are these things occurring? It's a really, really fascinating interview. And if you enjoyed today's episode, uh, be sure to subscribe to the podcast, Warrior Radio. So with all that said, let's dive into today's episode with Todd Murphy. For those that don't know, can you tell us who you are and what you do? Well, my name is Todd Murphy, and I'm a member of Laurentian University's Behavioral Neurosciences Program. And, of course, I have to add that I'm a member of the program, not, invo not enrolled in the university. And I, along with everyone else in our research group, has been doing work investigating the neuroscience, the neurology of religious and mystic experiences since the early 90s. We're best known for Dr. Persinger's and Stan Koren's God Helmet, which has elicited religious and mystic experiences in laboratory settings. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's how I found out about you, and I, I got uh, a bunch of questions I want to ask you about the God Helmet and the Please. science behind uh, how it works with the brain. But before we get into uh, the God Helmet, can you take us back and tell us a little bit about your personal story, how you eventually found yourself at this intersection point between science and spirituality? Well, it started, I would say, uh, when I was eight years old, perhaps seven years old, and uh, I had temporal lobe epilepsy, which is also called complex partial epilepsy. And uh, my seizures were near-death experiences. Now, with this kind of epilepsy, the seizures are almost never convulsive. If you were to look at someone who is having a seizure of this type, you wouldn't notice anything amiss. Um, they would simply be withdrawn, quiet, uh, perhaps look a bit introspective and uh, reflective. And I had some very unusual, very powerful experiences during these seizures. Now at the ripe old age of uh, eight, I didn't know how to interpret them or to respond to them. But some of the sensations that I experienced included out of body experiences. I remember having dinner with my brothers and my father. He was playing a piece of music for us. Perhaps some of your older listeners will remember the song, Little Boxes, little boxes on the hillside, and they're all made out of ticky-tacky. Little boxes on the hillside, and they all look just the same. And while we were listening to this song, which I think my father wanted to use to illustrate some point, I found myself suspended below the ceiling looking down at the scene. I knew that I wasn't, I felt that I wasn't supposed to be there. You're not allowed to go out of your body. It's like, you're not allowed to leave the house after dark. You're not allowed to leave your body. There were certain realms of existence that I knew about 
that I've been taught about, things like heaven, hell, purgatory, limbo, where the souls of babies wait to, before they're born. And I knew that I wasn't in any of them. So somehow I felt that I was sure to be doing something wrong. And with an act of will that was almost painful, I willed myself back into my body, but I didn't succeed completely. I was half in my body and half out of my body at the same time. And there are a few accounts of uh, out of body experiences where people have been half in and half out. One of them coming from brain, a brain stimulation session on an operating table in the 1950s with the uh, Canadian neurosurgeon uh, Wilder Penfield. So that was pretty powerful, being out of my body. Now that's the one I remember best. There were others, and I know that there were more. I'm quite sure there were more than I actually remember. But that wasn't the most powerful thing I experienced. I had a visual illusion called macropsia. And in this illusion, things seem like they're larger and farther away than they actually are. Now, you and I are talking over the phone, but if we were talking in person and you were sitting 10 feet from me and it was five feet from the soles of your feet to the top of your head, it would seem that you were 100 feet from me and 50 feet from the bottom of your feet to the top of your head. Everything became larger and farther away, but it still subtended the same angle. So even though you're seeing everything as, as though it is uh, massively shifted in its spatial dimension, uh, you're actually still seeing exactly the same things that you would be seeing in a normal state of consciousness. Now, that's what I saw with my eyes open. When my eyes were closed, this sense of things being larger expanded until it looked like I was looking into an infinite space with a tiny point of light in the middle of it, unutterably brilliant, uh, a, a point of light that seemed to be alive and conscious and actually malevolent evil. Um, I felt that it was going, it was out to get me and that it was filled with anger and hatred and that if I got too close to it, it would destroy me. Now, these were the interpretations of, a, of an eight or nine year old. So, of course, they were way off the mark. But the seizures were also filled with an incredible sense of fear. And it's not because the experiences were frightening. Lots of people have had the same experiences and actually enjoyed them. But rather because the area of the brain that's involved in spatial perception, one of the most crucial spatial reasoning centers in the brain, the hippocampus on the right side, is immediately next door to and heavily intergrown with the amygdala on the right side. And the amygdala on the right side is specialized for fear. So the seizure began working on my uh, spatial perception and cognitions because that's what the right hippocampus does. But as soon as it recruited the next door neighbor structure, instantly the experience also became filled with fear. So I decided that what I was afraid of was what I was experiencing. In fact, I was experiencing fear and other sensations at the same time. And I simply assumed that they belong together. Now let's fast forward. And now I am uh, 28, 29 years old, and I become involved in spirituality. So I had a, some spiritual teachers, a couple of American Indian teachers. Later on, I spent some time with a spiritual healer and a guru from India. This whole uh, process educated me to the spiritual traditions of India and Asia, in fact, I spent a year in India and two and a half years in Thailand, a country that's 95% Buddhist, and I learned what I could about their religions, and when you're living in the country, it's easy to learn. Uh, now let's fast forward again, and now I'm 34 years old, and I'm watching a television documentary. I was actually uh, staying at someone else's house for the weekend out in the country with my, with my kid, and there was a TV documentary on about near-death experiences, and they were showing a guy who, had, who was wearing a yellow helmet with some uh, electronic parts attached to the outside of it. It was the God helmet. And the subject in the film was saying, I'm in an infinite black space with a tiny point of light, very, very far away. And as soon as I saw that, I said, okay, that's it right there. That's my career. 
I knew that it was a scientific experiment and that all scientific experiments are supported by hypotheses. You can't have an experiment unless it's intended to validate or falsify a specific hypothesis. Every experiment is designed to answer a question, and the question comes from a theory or an hypothesis. But um, I knew that this guy on the screen was being stimulated using a science that I knew nothing about, and it was going to do a better job at answering the questions, what had happened to me when I was seven to 10 years old, than all of the teachings of Buddhism and all the uh, Kundalini theories of, of Hinduism. The, you know, I had read a lot on Hinduism, Kundalini chakras, reincarnation, the great spiritual teachers and so forth, but nowhere in any of that did I find an answer to that question, what in the world had happened. In Buddhism, there are a very few uh, scanty references to experiences like this. Uh, I didn't happen to encounter them until much later. But along the way, uh, prior to my involvement with spiritual teachers and New Age and Hinduism and Buddhist spirituality, I had studied history and philosophy of science. So I could understand immediately the structure of the science that I was seeing in that one instance, because all experimental science has similar structures. So I said, this is it. That's my career. That's what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. And I'm doing that work. Mm. And Michael Persinger, uh, the person who uh, uh, was part of the him and I think another individual who created the God Helmet, uh, the, uh, Michael Persinger was your mentor for a number of years. Um, and, uh, you know, he was able to stimulate certain areas of the brain with this helmet to lead to out of body experiences. Um, before we get into more of more detail about the God Helmet, what are the other type of experiences people are having with this device? Um, it depends on whether or not you're talking about uh, laboratory use or use at home. Uh, now, laboratory mm -hmm. use is much more careful. So I have a few accounts in front of me now, which I will read to you. The scientific literature generally, in summary, says that all of the individual episodes that have happened in near-death experiences have also been stimulated with the God Helmet, which has led to a misunderstanding in a lot of websites online. The statement that individual episodes in near-death experiences have been, or individual phenomena, have been recreated with the God Helmet has been distorted into the claim, which no one is really making, that the God Helmet can create entire near-death experiences or that stimulation with the God Helmet is going to be exactly like near-death experiences. No one has ever had a complete near-death experience with the God Helmet that I'm aware of. So there have been a number of reports of visions of God. About 1% of the subjects reported that. That's how it got the name God Helmet. As you mentioned, there have been a good number of out-of-body experiences, though I don't have statistics on that. Quite a number of emotional episodes including with one configuration, uh, experiences of fear and anxiety and apprehensiveness. When that happens, they quickly change the stimulation. Uh, but they also take note that the phenomena did indeed appear. And the single most common experience in the laboratory is the experience of the sensed presence, where a person feels that there's someone or something in the room with them, or in this case, the experimental chamber, but when they turn to look, there's no one there. So outside of that sort of broad summary information, I have a few specific uh, comments. There was one person apparently who sensed that her cat was in the chamber where they were receiving the stimulation. Others have experienced, and I quote, white light and that sort of thing. That's a quotation from Lone Frank's book, The Neurotourist. The same source says that there was a Japanese lady who sat there with tears running down her cheeks, jabbering away in Japanese. She said it had been sublime. My apologies for the ethnocentrism in the word jabbering, but that's the text that I find in the book. Jack Hitt, who wrote an article in Wired magazine in the late 90s, said, Occasionally, I surface to a state where I sort of know where I am, but not quite. This feeling is cool like being reinserted into my body. 
Then there's a separation again of body and soul, and almost by my will, I happily allow myself to drift back to the surprisingly durable lightness of oblivion. I did have a fairly convincing out-of-body experience. Uh, now, strange to relate, this same author also rated the overall experience at a 4 out of 10. After enjoying oblivion and having an out-of-body experience, one must wonder what he was expecting. There was a journalist from the British Independent who said that they were playing some music, vaguely new age with Eastern temple sounding bells. And this offered his mind a suggestion. And he went off on uh, sort of a tour with a distinctly Eastern Tibetan feel. It gradually increased in intensity and conviction until suddenly, with a kind of booster rocket of realism, he was actually in a temple, in a line of solemn Tibetan monks, grave-eyed brown cowls around their heads, the bells tolling loudly now, echoing in my head. In fact, I too, he says, was a Tibetan monk. And then he realized that he, he understood the obvious truth. We were off to make our observances as we had day after day since time immemorial, bells, high seriousness, magisterial pacing, solemn monkish eyes, at which stage a voice came over the intercom and the session was over. He said it was like a dream, but like a waking dream. Now, your question is a good one and it's the obvious question to ask, but the way Dr. Persinger writes his research reports he doesn't give the subjective experiences the way the subjects report them. He classifies them and then writes about the classification. So a person could be seeing God, having a conversation with a dead relative or meeting their cat, and you would never know it from Dr. Persinger's publications. He has never sensationalized his results. He lets other people do that for him. Mm. Uh, so that I, makes it a little bit hard to, to get a handle on what kinds of experiences are happening. Now, I deal in the commercially available version of the God Helmet, which your listeners can see at spiritualbrain.com. And there, I do get some reports. I wish I got more reports. But then on the other hand, no one is obligated to send me any reports. Um, but when people use it at home, there are some differences. For one thing, in the laboratory, they're done in an acoustic chamber, an absolutely silent environment. And this is because the stimulation is delivered over the temporal lobes of the brain, the area that is most implicated as far as the surface area, the different lobes are concerned, in the production of altered states, hallucinatory experiences, and spiritual experiences. A large part of the temporal lobe's ongoing activity is dedicated to monitoring ambient sound. I interpret it as an old evolutionary program so that if you went into an altered state 200,000 years ago when our species first appeared, a nighttime altered state, and night being, uh, doing these things at night helps uh, because that's when the melatonin levels are rising in the brain. So the easiest way for a person to go into a trance or a, um, an altered state, there's another word that I I'm looking for, but it's not coming to mind, in, our, in the very dawn of our species, was to simply be the one who stayed up feeding the fire, keeping the predators away. So you gaze at the fire, and you gaze at it some more, and you gaze at it some more, and eventually you can begin to have autokinetic effects. Your internal dialogue can shut down. You can uh, sort of go off. But the minute an animal nearby steps on a twig and makes that cracking noise, you come out of that state instantly, that trance, that's the word. You come out of the trance and you're immediately ready to scan the environment and see what kind of threats might be out there. So that you could go from an altered state, an hypnotic state, and back into full alertness on a dime. Mm. And that means that little noises can distract people from altered state experiences, which is why quiet environments are best for meditation practice, why it's crude to make noise in a church where people are praying. You don't go into church to have a conversation. No matter what you see in the mafia movies, in point of fact, a church, a sanctuary is supposed to be quiet. 
And there's never a sign at the door that says, you are entering a church, please be quiet. Everybody just sort of instinctively knows it's an environment in which silence is golden. Now, people at home using the same technology don't have access to the same true silence. So one of the things that happens is, first of all, that sense of a presence experience doesn't really come up, but other experiences do. So I have a few user reports here. You can stop me when you've heard enough mm -hmm. because they do go on. One of them said, after the first try with one of the God Helmet sessions, I was a little uncomfortable, but also felt much happier and felt a kind of flow, energy flow, he says in question marks, inside my body. This continued for a few days before its intensity started to fade. The next time I tried, I didn't have the uncomfortable feeling, but one of happiness, and I would say a different look at things and the world. Now, this report emphasizes the after effects of the session, wow. even though he does say that, and the after effects went on for a few days. Can Another you, one? I'm sorry to, to, to interrupt you, but can you talk a little bit about how the, the helmet actually works? Certainly, I'll put down this list of ports and jump to that. The way it works is that it first stimulates the right side of the brain only with a signal that doesn't belong to any particular structure. It's a kind of a chirp signal, which is the name for a type of signal that a lot of function generators create. And it mimics uh, a chirp pattern, one that rapidly changes its pitch, much the way many bird calls, bird chirps do. And this uh, activates or excites the whole right hemisphere of the brain all at once. It doesn't zoom in or uh, target any one structure. But because the amygdala on the right is specialized for fear, as I mentioned before, and the amygdala is one of the most sensitive structures in the brain, it uses more blood than other brain parts, uh, it's the most common source uh, of origin for epileptic seizures, which is a very strong indicator of its higher uh, sensitivity. The person can go, go into fear or anxiety or from the very same stimulation. And this, I believe, is actually more common. It can begin to elicit imagery as it stimulates the right hippocampus, but not the one on the left. Now, if someone does experience any fear or anxiety at home, they can click on a button and be moved to the second phase of the session within about 10 seconds. If it happens in the lab and they report it, they'll switch to the second phase of the session very quickly. The second phase of the session applies the amygdala signal over both sides and the, le the left amygdala, that one, the one that specialized for joy and bliss, elation, happiness and so forth, that one suddenly springs into action and the person can find themselves with a combination of strong imagery from the right hippocampus together with strong positive, positive is too small a word, we want to use words like joy, bliss, ecstasy. Those two things can combine to create an actual mystic experience, one that's characterized by bliss and joy. That's with sessions that utilize the amygdala signal. When a different session is applied that uses a signal belonging to the hippocampus, focusing it on the right, then the effects of the session can go in a very different direction. Still positive, very desirable, very, well, I want to say blissful, but blissful has the wrong flavor. There can be deep states of detachment, equanimity, calm, the peace which passeth understanding, as well as a sensation of silence and darkness. And darkness here connotes a, um, uh, something very, very positive, even though the word darkness often has a negative connotation. Now, from memory, I'm going to quote a British poet, Henry Vaughan, who said, There is in God... Some say a deep but dazzling dark, and that's the kind of darkness that the God Helmet can elicit for people with sensitive hippocampuses and a hippocampal stimulation. The world goes silent, and instead of losing the world that you're in, as you feel darkness and silence, you find yourself falling into 
another aspect of what might feel like reality, but is actually another state of your consciousness in which there is a peerless and flawless contentment. One class of God helmet experiments and God helmet stimulations that use the amygdala signal can uh, culminate in, in bliss. And another one that uses the hippocampal signal can culminate in uh, peace, calm, and a detachment from the world that feels like your own mind has temporarily offered your own being a sanctuary from the tribulations of this world. Nay, says I, not this world, but the stress of living in a human mind, bound in a human brain and housed in a human body in a world that is really so often messed up. Well, why do you disrupt the left and right hemispheres in, on the first stage? And then why do you, because I've seen a few videos of you explaining the how it works, and it seems like this disruption between the left and right hemispheres really crucial initially. So why the disruption and why the right side first? Well, it isn't, it isn't a disruption of the left and right sides of the brain. Rather, one side is stimulated so that its excitement outstrips the activity, the excitement level of the other side. And this happens all the time. Anytime you clear your head in order to focus and concentrate on something, your one side of your brain is going to be more excited than the other. Anytime you have a moment of true happiness, you know, you find a suitcase filled with hundred dollar bills, you're going to have a mood come on you. And I guarantee you, neurologically speaking, in terms of the brain's hemispheres, you're going to have an asymmetrical activation of your brain. Asymmetry is a very desirable thing unless it happens in the wrong context. Fear, real fear, will put your brain in an asymmetrical state. It will ramp up the right side so strongly that moments of extreme fear have been known to elicit out-of-body experiences. But once you have one side of the brain more active than the other, when one side of the brain becomes more active than the other, the other side will become less active than usual. And when that side of the brain is suddenly and dramatically brought back into activation, the result can be a spiritual experience. Mm. So we, we have one side of the brain outstrip the other, but we don't disrupt communication between the two hemispheres. Nothing that the God helmet can do can shut down communication along the interhemispheric structures. A lot of your listeners will know the corpus callosum, as the main structure that connects the two hemispheres. And we don't do anything that stops it from, from communicating. Hmm. It's simply that the two hemispheres of the brain have a lot less to talk about in that moment. Hmm. And you say uh, on the second phase, the left side, well, if you're targeting the amygdala, it's, it suddenly shows an increased activity. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that stage and what is it about the amygdala that seems to be associated with uh, mystical experiences? Well, first of all, in this instance, we're talking primarily about the left amygdala. Mm -hmm. And the left amygdala, uh, it was unknown for many years, but I would say in the last 20 years, there have been a number of studies that have demonstrated, and I don't mean from our research group, I mean from other universities and clinical environments and so forth. The left amygdala is specialized for positive emotions. If you want the positive emotions to go beyond the normal range of feeling good, you have to activate it in a context, in a circumstance, as part of a sequence of activation that wouldn't come up very much in your normal life. So having the left amygdala stimulated immediately after stimulation of the right hemisphere allows it to come forth with greater refinement than it usually would. So that in the context of the God helmet stimulation, the bliss and the joy comes from the fact that the left amygdala is bursting into activity more quickly than other areas on the left side of the brain. The trick is not just to activate the left amygdala to elicit a, a godly state of consciousness. It's to do it in a way that would ordinarily not happen in your day-to-day -day life. Mm. Spiritual experiences rely on ordinary brain parts being activated or excited 
in extraordinary ways. So the trick is not to just stimulate the amygdala on the left, but to do it so that it is jumping into activity after a period of staying quiet and inhibited is mm. the exact word. And from what I understand, you guys, the, the God helmet uses magnetic signals. Uh, why, what is it about magnetic signals that um, leads to these experiences? Well, the patterns that are embedded in the magnetic fields, the magnetic signals match the patterns. In fact, they're derived from patterns that we find at work in the hippocampus and in the amygdala because these are electrical patterns and all electrical activity is accompanied by magnetic fields and all moving magnetic fields generate electricity. No trick to get the brain to produce these electrical signals on its own. But because the context is so very different from what we experience in our day-to-day -day lives, the resulting experiences are very different from what we experience uh, in our normal lives. Mm. How did, so Mike, Michael Persinger is famous for finding a lot of this, these discoveries. Uh, can you explain yes. a little bit behind, you know, how he stumbled upon these findings and some of the research that has been done to verify some of these, uh, some of these experiences people are having? It started off when he was testing a magnetic stimulation device in the early 90s. It was a crude affair and it's no longer available. It was called the Relaxit, R-E-L-A-X-Z-I-T. It sounds like it makes your zits relax, but it was actually supposed to make people relaxed, which it did, but not particularly well. Um, but what Dr. Persinger was studying is memory consolidation. So he wanted to see whether magnetic stimulation would interfere with the brain's electrical activity because of the intimate relationship between the two enough to disrupt memory consolidation. So he, he had a number of subjects receive the relaxit uh, stimulation. And while they were receiving the stimulation, he read, uh, he or one of the students read them a brief story. And then after the experiment was done, they compared the recall of the story uh, from those who received the stimulation compared to those who did not. And what they found was those who had received this crude and somewhat random stimulation, didn't remember the story as well as those who received no stimulation. So there's the aha, there's the light bulb going on over the head. And it says magnetic uh, fields can indeed influence the brain. So the next step was in his, at his desk, not in the laboratory. And he reasoned that if these kinds of uh, random undirected magnetic pulses and, and bursts and blips and, and so forth could change the brain's activity so as to disturb memory, could signals with real content, signals that meant something to the brain, elicit specific effects? Could specific brain signals elicit specific brain effects? So he went on a search, which I am given to understand, took him quite a while and eventually managed to find a pattern derived from the amygdala. It was a burst firing pattern. It was first observed in epileptics, and then once uh, one of his colleagues knew what they were looking for, they found that the same signal was also present in normal people. And because amygdalar seizures are very often temporal lobe seizures and not grand mal ones, and temporal lobe seizures have a track record for eliciting mystic experiences, it looked like this was, this put him on to something. Another colleague came up with a, a chirp pattern that embedded or made use of common uh, peak uh, frequencies in the brain, frequencies that the brain produced more naturally than others. And that is where the word frequency enters and exits this, this discussion. The effective signals are not frequencies. They're complex patterns. If you imagine the shape of a city skyline with thin buildings and then thick buildings and low buildings and high buildings, you get an idea what these kinds of signals can look like. If you have a hundred hertz tone, you ha it would be as though every building in that city skyline were exactly the same. 
So he found the signal that would derive from the amygdala and that should, in principle, elicit amygdalar effects. When it was applied over the left side, it felt good. When it was applied over the right side, it felt not so good, a little bit unsettling. It didn't throw in anyone into any deep states of fear. It was just sort of brought up a state of apprehensiveness. So he said, okay, now I have the signal that will elicit the amygdala response on the left. All I have to do is apply it to the left side of the brain. How do I get the brain out of its normal habituated patterns in order to receive the signal and give us a mystic experience? which I don't think he was calling a mystic experience at the time. So they put in this other signal, the chirp signal, first on the right side because they wanted to elicit a response from the amygdala on the left and let it run. And it worked. But Dr. Persinger also knew that he was working in the temporal lobes and he wanted to get the, the temporal lobes defensiveness out of the picture. And that meant a silent environment. So he got what a I believe it was the only grant of his entire career to build an acoustic chamber, which he did. And once it's also a Faraday cage, it screens out electromagnetic emissions from the surrounding area. A cell phone will not work in, in a Faraday cage, but a compass will still point north. So he had the chamber built, had the EM screening embedded in its design, And also it was vibration proof. So people walking around uh, nearby wouldn't distract the experimental subjects. So with all of that in place, he ran the experiment and it was a success. This is the protocol that eventually earned it the name God Helmet. Now what most people who follow the God Helmet unprofessionally don't know is that there are many other signals and protocols in use. The most important of them, to my mind, is the signal derived from the hippocampus because when it's applied to the right side of the brain in the right environment the mystic experience that it can create is not one of joy and bliss and light but rather one of depth silence darkness calm and the peace which passeth understanding now uh after he found this was there any you know outside research or you know any peer reviewed studies that verified what he found um there have been many studies that demonstrated that uh, magnetic stimulation can have effects on the brain lots of them uh, from many different fields in many different uh, areas of inquiry some of them are clinical some of them are simple eeg studies some of them are studies that simply look into how faint a magnetic field can elicit a response from the brain. It turns out that that is in the Pico Tesla range. Very, very, very faint magnetic fields. However, uh, there was a researcher in Canada. His name was Montoya, and he did some magnetic stimulation studies that uh, corroborated Dr. Persinger's work. The university clamped him down. Last year, he announced, uh, I believe, told Dr. Persinger, who put it in a paper, that he intends to go ahead and publish his research. More recently, uh, there was a research, a couple of researchers in Brazil who were able to duplicate or replicate one of Dr. Persinger's studies. They, working with only minimal funding, were not able to get the kind of dramatic effects that Dr. Persinger is known for, but they were able to replicate uh, one of Dr. Persinger's early studies that found significant changes in verbal behavior, the way people spoke with and without the stimulation. So yes, there has been independent corroboration and replication of the of some of the studies. Mm. But then you have to remember that Dr. Persinger has published over 500 medical, academic, peer-reviewed publications, of which I would say, guessing conservatively, about 75 are concerned with uh, God helmet stimulation. Mm. As far as people reproducing the actual stimulation that elicited the visions of God, which they refer to as the sensed presence protocol. I've had a few inquiries uh, from people who want to use my equipment. Unfortunately, they all come from psychologists Uh. and not neuroscientists. And I will tell you without naming names that some of the most amateurish 
errors I have seen in experimental protocols have come from people with PhDs. <laughs> when someone says to me, don't worry, we'll get it all right, we're PhDs, my response is, yeah, right, you're a PhD, it doesn't mean you can repair a transmission. Uh -huh. It means that you can assess and carry out psychological studies if your PhD is in psychology. And just because there are questions about the psychology of religion that are addressed by these uh, neurological studies does not mean they are studies in psychology. Uh -huh. So anyway, I could complain about the state of science's understanding of spirituality for a very long time and fill up two or three of these podcasts, <laughs> but I won't subject your listeners to that. Well, I will just say that the standards for reproducing Dr. Persinger's protocols are high. He put a long time and a great deal of effort into developing the protocols. And when he finally got them to work, not only were they intricate, rich in detail, but also as in the case of the acoustic chamber and the Faraday cage, not cheap to carry out. Uh, I was going to ask, uh, with the God helmet, a really common experience is, like you were saying, this feeling of presence um, of another mm -hmm. person or another being beside you. So can you talk a little bit about this common experience? Sure. And I'm glad to hear you say common because it happens to people all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember speaking, speaking to a woman who had broken up with her husband and was unhappy about it. And she had several episodes where she felt like her now ex-husband was standing in the room with her while uh, seriously depressed about the end of her relationship. What happens in that case is, un is best understood by recognizing that there are two senses of self on the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain. The left side of the brain is where the language centers are. So we are ourselves in so many ways because of and through the words we share with other people are primarily left hemispheric beings. The left hemispheric sense of self is the one that we identify ourselves with, the one that we feel is me. The right hemispheric sense of self exists primarily through most of our waking moments, to support the one on the left. When the communication between the two hemispheres breaks down, primarily through an excess of activity between the two, but it can also happen when there isn't enough activity, enough uh, information between the two, then the right hemisphere sense of self can work on its own. We can experience it as a unique entity but because we can't identify with more than one self at a time, we can't have one I at a time. We experience the right hemispheric sense of self as an external entity and project it outside ourselves and respond to it as though it were a non-physical entity, a spirit being, a ghost, an angel. And in the case of a very small number of people with the God helmet, again, about 1%, God. So the sense presence is an experience in which we encounter our own right hemispheric sense of self as though it were another being. Mm. Yeah, that's fascinating because um, uh, I've read accounts on with the God Helmets online, and that's such a common experience people talk about. Um, I was going to ask... Is there any, uh, you know, negative side effects or warnings that you caution people uh, that want to experience the helmet, especially people that don't have, uh, or, you know, are just everyday folk out there that don't have a lot of experience with something like, um, you know, TDCS or things like that? So are, are there any negative side effects or are there any other people that shouldn't use this type of device? In the software that drives the Shiva God helmet, and if anybody wants to see sort of animated illustrations that explain how the God Helmet works. They can go to spiritualbrain.com and scroll down to where it says God Helmet and click on that. And there are some rather unsophisticated animations there to show it. In the software for the God Helmet, there are six sessions. The repertoire is not extremely large because there are many ways of using it that simply would not be effective. So it isn't loaded up with extra sessions that we know aren't going to do anything. But the primary one, the 
sense presence protocol that begins with right hemispheric stimulation and can elicit some anxiety. It warns people about that specifically. And it says that if the, uh, if you do experience fear or anxiety and most people don't, it's not a common effect, but because it's a potentially negative effect, we have to give it a full range of cautions and warnings and informed consent material. If that happens, there is something you click on that will automatically roll you over to the second phase of the session, which is the more pleasant side. That's uh, not a risk if you know it's going to happen. If you choose to see a horror movie, you're expecting to be afraid. If you're into paranormal investigations and you go into a haunted mansion, you expect to be afraid. But that's not a side effect. That's something you anticipate. So as far as cautions and warnings for certain types of people, because the God Helmet has not been tested on people with psychiatric disorders, in the laboratory, people with psychiatric disorders were excluded from the studies. There has been no systematic study on how it will interact with depression, schizophrenia, PTSD, and things like that. So we encourage people who uh, have psychiatric disorders not to obtain a system. Besides that, there is the warning which you will find on every single consciousness technology available on the internet. And it says don't use it if you have epilepsy. And the reason is that systematic uh, studies of this technology with epilepsy would be sure to elicit a few seizures, at least in its early rounds. I know that Dr. Persinger has one subject who came in for a very long time and received extremely brief uh, stimulations with the God helmet on a daily basis. And their seizures eventually either were severely reduced or stopped. I don't know how that came out. But that's a very rare instance, and that's under the under the in-person guidance of a clinical neuroscientist, a clinical neurologist. So that's a very different beast from trying it at home with epilepsy. Every single brain stimulation techniques, binaural beats, flashing lights, cranioelectrical stimulation, a DTCMS that you mentioned, all of them have warnings about using it for epilepsy. Besides that, there are none. There are some safeties built into it. You don't have... If somebody has something happen that they don't like, it's very easy to stop it. Mm -hmm. And if they simply pay attention to the warning that says, don't use this if you have major depression or schizophrenia or uh, PTSD, or if you're a raving maniac of any kind, then this isn't for you. Mm -hmm. I don't particularly want to have people buying my uh, God helmet, which I'll mention has a letter of uh, an endorsement from Dr. Persinger, if they're a raving maniac, because then when they call me up for tech support, I've got a raving maniac on the phone and I don't enjoy them very much. I work with them. Somebody has a question, I answer it if, even if they're asking in a language I don't speak very well. But <laughs> I would be doing a disservice to some people if I were to invite such people. So, you know, based off of your years working with this technology, do you think when someone is has a helmet on and they're experiencing these, you know, profound out-of-body experiences, do you think they're tapping into sort of a divine mystical realm or do you believe this is just some, you know, it's just specialized brain activity that's causing this? You know, when Harry Potter had his near-death experience in The Deathly Hallows Part 2, he asked Dumbledore, is all of this real or is it just happening in my head? And Dumbledore turned to him and said, why should it happening in your head mean that it isn't real? Hmm. So whether or not it's happening in another dimension or it's only happening in a person's head, is a philosophical question, one that's intended to find out whether or not there are other ranges or other realms or dimensions of existence. And if there are, are human spiritual experiences a way to tap into those dimensions? I'm not concerned with that. Hmm. I'm concerned with people being able to grow spiritually, have spiritual experiences, achieve positive states of mind, and ultimately feel good. I don't care whether the tools that are at my disposal allow people to access other dimensions 
or they only work in the brain. So long as they allow people to access feeling good. Mm. Nothing yeah. is more important than that. But having, but having given my philosophical answer to your philosophical question, let me try and answer your ontological one. And that is, I think it's probably all happening in our head while we're alive and in human bodies. Once uh-huh. we die and we're no longer in the body, other rules may apply. But ultimately, I can't know if that's right or not. What I do know is that if I assume that all of these experiences and states of consciousness are are nothing but, as Shakespeare put it, the very coinage of our brains, I can make discoveries. But if someone says to me, I know that all of this is happening in the seventh realm of existence, wherein exist the angelic deities, the apsaras and gandharvas and the high and holy immortal gods. There's nothing I can do with that. I can't turn that into an hypothesis that will allow me to frame guesses that I can then go out and investigate. Mm -hmm. So I work with the idea that everything we experience is our brains, but that is an hypothesis of convenience. Mm -hmm. I compare it to, um, I have a book, Sacred Pathways, the Brain's Role in Religious and Mystic Experiences. It's on Amazon. And there's a lot of talk about the God Helmet, a whole chapter dedicated to it. But in the introduction to that book where I'm trying to explain to the reader what I'm doing, I liken it to a naval, the Navy, not your belly button, a naval breakdown voyage where they will build a battleship or a destroyer and then they will take it out with a special crew and they will run it at top speed They will look at the weather charts, looking for the roughest seas. And if they find a real major perfect storm, they'll head right there. And they will run every system on that ship through everything it can do, looking for things to break down. Then when they have logged all of the errors and all the problems, they take it back into the uh, naval shipyard and repair everything. In some cases, replacing entire systems. Then they will take it out and run it again in huge storms uh, at unimaginably uh, punishing speeds for the, for the ship's engines. And they will, again, note anything that goes wrong. And then they take it back in and fix everything. And they take it out again and again until everything works so that the failures of the ship are what guarantee its eventual perfection or near perfection. So this is what I want to do with the idea that mind is brain activity. Take it out and run it into every circumstance until one appears that we cannot explain as the activity of the brain creating mind. And that spot, whatever it is, may prove to be the point where another reality manifesting through human consciousness might be found. We can't take a point of philosophy that everything is pure consciousness, bliss, truth, uh, as it's expressed in in Hinduism, usually truth, consciousness, bliss, sat chit ananda. We can't say that that's the true ground reality and then go looking for it. We have to look for everything and wait for the point where sat chit ananda breaks through and presents itself to us because the parameters of that manifestation will be the guideposts to eventual real research into it if it exists. And if it doesn't exist, think of all the things about consciousness that we will have discovered along the way. The discoveries will be enormous, mind-boggling, and I dare say, beautiful. Mm. Now, there's a trend uh, that I've read to some experimenters are incorporating this type of technology into virtual reality. So I just want to get your thoughts on this or, and generally, where do you see the future of this technology heading? As far as incorporation with virtual reality, uh, I believe that Dr. Persinger toyed with that idea in the early days, uh, let's say the mid nineties. But when some experiments, and I don't believe they were actually published with frequent repetition, the God helmet stopped working that well. 
That is to say, you can't use it too often. There is a schedule for use that's based on once a week sessions. And that's not for safety anywhere near so much as it is for effectiveness. Uh, people habituate to it. So if you're going to play a video game or wear a, a special uh, eyepiece, you know, like the Oculus Rift or something, and augment the immersion with God helmet stimulation, you'll only be able to do it effectively for uh, an hour or perhaps pushing the envelope a little bit too. And after that, the brain will begin to habituate to it and it will no longer give you an immersive experience. Uh, if you eat a chocolate bar, it tastes great. We love the taste of chocolate. We love sweet things. But if you eat nothing but chocolate, not only will you begin to stop really tasting the confection, um, but you'll actually begin to become a little bit disgusted with it. Too much of a good thing is a bad thing, as they say in China. So moderation in all things. Um, and as far as the future of the technology is concerned, I believe it has all the next future. There will be another one after that. But I believe that it's already arrived. And people who want to see it in action, they can go again to spiritualbrain.com and look for the Shiva system. The God Helmet arranges the magnetic coils over the temporal lobes, above the ears. The Shiva system is known as the octopus in Persinger's laboratory, arranges the coils in a circlet around the head and rotates them with constantly changing intervals from one pair of coils, one pair of magnetic coils to the next. And what Dr. Persinger found is that this can increase the accuracy of remote viewing as well as elicit telepathic communication between brains. So I think that's the future. Not making short, flashy experiences as the God Helmet does. They're very desirable, but at the same time, it's a brief experience. Whereas the uh, Shiva neural system, the effects build up from session to session so that instead of uh, creating spiritual experiences, it enhances, facilitates, or even creates spiritual growth. And that is, I think, what the world is going to reward more heavily in the long run. Not whether or not you can have an electronic or an electromagnetic or a magnetic high, but whether or not you can actually grow and mimic some of the effects of long-term meditation, long-term prayer, uh, yoga practices that are carried on for years. It does look as if people use it correctly and uh, their life offers the good environment. That usually means a spiritual practice of some kind. Then they can find that they have responses to meditation practice in a few weeks that would otherwise take a few years. Mm. And because it's beginning to look like this world is not going to be too much fun to live in in the coming decades, any technology that allows people to get more joy out of life or have more equanimity and contentment in this life is going to be heavily rewarded. We may come up with technologies that do much more interesting things, but I can't imagine that we'll ever come up with a technology that will be more fulfilling than the Shiva neural stimulation system. And the new directions for the technology, as it looks to me right now, are not going to consist in the next instance, never mind the one after that. They're going to consist of new and more sophisticated ways of using the technology we already have. In one example, there are a few people who have done God Helmet sessions. Only instead of doing the God Helmet session, first amygdala, I mean, sorry, first the chirp signal over the right, making the right side more active with inner imagery, followed by a, a blast of bliss, which makes a nice alliteration, a blisteringly blast of bliss. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> they would do one session and then wait 90 minutes and then do the exact same session again. And in one of the trials of this session design, where two sessions are done back to back in the laboratory, what they found was that the EEG response of the second session was three times more powerful or robust in the language of EEG interpretation, three times more robust than one session would have been alone. So doing two sessions in a row did not get you double the effects, it got you triple the effect.
Mm. Now, this is a very new protocol, and it has been available to people who use one of the neural stimulation systems, uh, Shakti, which is a uh, sort of truncated God helmet using only two channels instead of four, less sophisticated, but still worthwhile, um, also cheaper. Mm. Well, Todd, if, and, if, uh, an, a sorry, number of them have had... Sorry to cut you off, but uh, we're just running a little bit short on time. Um, okay. But if folks want to learn more about you online, just want to make sure people know where they can find you and some of your books that are on Amazon, where they can, uh, some of the recommendation, uh, recommended readings that you point people to for more of your work. Well, my name is Todd Murphy, and my first book has a forward by the Dalai Lama, so they can Google my name and Dalai Lama, or they can just go to spiritualbrain.com, and uh, they will be quickly forwarded over to a less memorable uh, Internet address, but they'll find all of these uh, neural stimulation systems and the books in place. My most recent book is called Deja Vu and Other Spiritual Gifts, and it has nothing to do with the technology whatsoever. It's all organic, natural, mind-powered uh, methods for spiritual work. All right. Thanks, Todd, for sitting down with me. If you enjoyed today's episode, go check out his website, spiritualbrain.com, and you'll learn more about the God Helmet and all the different uh, science and tech that we talked about in today's episode.